This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You've got to have the right case because if you take it up and it's the wrong case, then you can make some really bad law that's going to affect a lot of plaintiffs. There's always an answer. The joy is in finding. One of the reasons that I love being a lawyer is this exact process. The way we live our life has nothing to do with the presentation sequence at trial. As trial lawyers, we pick up and move on and keep going. You're losing or gaining one out of every 10 jurors, which can really make a huge difference in the ultimate result of the case. Whatever you think about, you create. Learn all you can and never stop. And then have the guts to try case after case after case. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, we have a a good friend of mine, in fact, one of my classmates from the Trial Lawyers College back in 1998, uh, a great trial lawyer from Longview, Texas, John Sloan. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michael. Thank you for having me on. I've I've enjoyed listening to your podcast since you started it, and I uh, jumped at the chance to be a guest on it. So I'm ready to try to teach some things and uh, hopefully help some lawyers out there. Well, thank you. And I'm I'm still honored and, and frankly, somewhat surprised that people listen to me. Um, I started this thing a couple of years ago. I didn't know anyone but my mom would ever listen to it. Uh, but uh, yeah. it's, been, it's been something fun. And, and luckily, it's been something that I think we've been able to provide useful content. Uh, so tell me, tell us all a little bit about your practice. I think a lot of people know who you are through the Trial Lawyers College, because uh, uh, you've served as the president of the Trial Lawyers College, but you're also known, you know, maybe not as, as widely nationally, but definitely in Texas as in New Mexico as a very successful trial lawyer in your own right. So tell me a little bit about, you know, your practice and what you do. Well, I, uh, this month was my 40th year uh, since I was sworn in as a lawyer in 1980. Uh, and I was, uh, I started out in a small town, uh, my hometown of uh, Henderson, Texas. Uh, I didn't even take the time to drive to Austin to get sworn in. I, my boss at the time uh, administered the oath in front, in front of my mom and dad. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it, I was very lucky. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, starting out in that I, uh, was pretty much left unsupervised. In fact, I was told by my boss who was a great guy and I loved him to death. Don't come ask me any questions, figure it out yourself. And, uh, he meant it. He did. He didn't, yeah, he didn't mind having a, you know, a little discussion at the start of the day about politics or the weather or any, something like that, but he didn't want to talk to me about lawsuits because he was involved in uh, real estate development and building hotels. So about five weeks after he administered that oath to me, uh, I announced ready in a, a murder trial in my Gosh. hometown there and tried that case by myself from start to finish. Uh, and, uh, you know, so in the first three years of my practice, I tried murder cases, uh, aggravated assault cases, a DWI case, a uh, handful of uh, car wreck cases, a boundary line dispute between a 93 and a 91 year old, uh, 93 and 91 year old men that were neighbors, divorce cases. I mean, I, I handled and tried them all. So you tried a bunch of cases. How did you kind of learn how to try cases? I mean, you're, you know, you went to law school, but you only learned so much there. And what is it you did to kind of figure out, okay, what's going to work for me? Well, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, emulation, a lot of copying of successful lawyers there in my hometown. Uh, We were across the street. Uh, to a firm called Welburn Houston. Um, and one of the lawyers in that firm, a guy named Glenn Perry, is one of my partners now. 
I, he and I reminisce a lot about being at the office late at night and uh, we'd stand on the opposite street corner and talk to each other before we finally went home. And as you know, I mean, trying to get started practicing law is not an eight to five or nine to five job. You know, there's a, a, a lawyer from Dallas named John Wilson, John Bad Wilson is, was his name. He was a big workers comp lawyer. And back in those days, we had lots of workers comp cases. And he always said that in order to become a good trial lawyer, you had to be a weekend warrior. So there might be some good trial lawyers now that don't work weekends, but that's not how they started out. And um, my son used to say, Dad, I, you know, I really don't want to be a lawyer because you got to work too hard. So I, you know, I would go across the street and I'd go to the district clerk's office and I'd get files out and I'd take them in the back room and I'd read depositions and I'd read pleadings and I'd, I'd beg, borrow and steal. Uh, what those guys across the street at the Welburn Houston firm were doing. And uh, I had really good training in the trial advocacy program at Baylor was a really good program. We had a great professor named Matt Dawson. And, um, you know, I guess the rest would be trial and error. Bless the hearts of some of my clients that I had at the time, because I probably was not the greatest to come down the pike, but we did okay. We did really well. Yeah, I've, I've looked back at you know my earlier trials where you know I was even some of my trials in the last ten years where you know, on one hand you go back and you kick yourself about like I wish I knew then what I know now, but if you really look at it, you know just the willingness to put the work in gave the client a better trial than probably a lot of other. Lawyer, first of all, a lot of other lawyers wouldn't have given them the trial. Would have found some way to plea it out or settle it, uh, and then you know just just having a lawyer that, that believes in you and is willing to put the work in, I think, is really eighty eighty five percent of it. I think that a lot of the other stuff we do is kind of just the marginal stuff that can make a difference in the right case, but at the very very heart of it, it's just doing the work and and believing what you say. Yeah, you know, Michael, you're exactly right. These clients, and, and, I, and I feel this way uh, even more strongly today, deserve to have a champion uh, that believes in them, uh, that, that knows that client, and who is willing to give the all that's necessary in order to give that person a good trial. Uh, you know, these guys that think that they can pick up a file on Monday morning and go over and try a case and do a great job uh, are sadly mistaken and they're shortchanging their clients. There's just no substitute for putting in all the work that's necessary to know the case backwards and forwards. One of our mentors, and I, I mean your, your mentor and mine is uh, Jerry Spence, who says that you got to put in 10 hours outside the courtroom for every one hour that you spend in the courtroom. At least. Yeah. I th yeah, I th yeah. I think that it's more like 20, 25. Uh, I think uh, there's just no substitute for being better prepared. Well, there's so much more information available now than even when I started. I mean, when I started practicing law, Cell phones existed, but I couldn't afford one even on a lawyer's salary because the per minute charge, and it was just a phone. It was not a uh, something that you could uh, look anything up on. You know, th there was an internet when I started, uh, but it wasn't much there. And, you know, you did dial up and maybe went to AOL, but there wasn't a whole lot of useful information on the internet everything was done on paper uh now the amount of information we can find uh that's potentially useful in a case is just exponentially increased and you know which is good because we find all kinds of great stuff i mean just uh corporate employees linkedin profiles sometimes when the difference between their job description and what they claim to do in a lawsuit and then you know once you put that out there you they open up a little more uh, but then it means it's even more work more preparation and then the uh, i think we're in the golden age of 
trial advocacy education. Uh, and there are so many really good people teaching things that are not necessarily consistent with each other. And so there's so much more information to process and to find what works for you and what works for the case that uh, it's wonderful, but it's also can be overwhelming. It definitely can. I mean, there's so many arrows that we can acquire and put in our quiver uh, to prepare for trial and go and try a case. It, it is. It's truly amazing. Um, you know, like I say, I learned from looking at files over at the district clerk's office. There weren't that many seminars that we could sign up for and go to and and sit at the feet of the masters and learn how they became who and what they are. Uh, there's really no excuse now uh, for not having the the top tools to use in trial because they're so readily available, like you say. Um, yeah, and the culture of sharing is really uh, changed too since I started because when you know, fairly early on in my career, I went to go work for an experienced trial lawyer, and for various reasons, he quit. Uh, and I had to start my own law firm way before I was ready. And uh, I remember I talked to another really, really, really good trial lawyer that had an office in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, Brownsville, where I lived, and asked him for a job. And he flat out told me, you know, Michael, if I hire you, you're going to learn all my secrets and go compete with me. Uh, and so I'm not going to hire you. Uh, and there was this sense that, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was a set of secrets that people had to keep to themselves for a competitive advantage. And, and now I see the exact opposite. I see this abundance mentality, people sharing, trying to all make each other better. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the attitude now is that rising water lifts all boats. So let's help each other out and go kick the butts of, uh, some big corporations and insurance companies. And ironically, I, I personally found, I don't know about you, but for business, when when I am freely sharing with other people, they're far more likely to bring me business opportunities. When they have that right case where they want help or need help, they're far more likely to go to the person that freely shared with them than the person said, no, this is mine. I'm not going to share with you. It's the you give to others, you tend to, to get back. I'm not saying that's the reason we should share. We should be willing to share whether or not we're going to get something in return, but I have found that over time that it, the money takes care of itself just fine. Well, and the amazing thing that, and you know this as well as I do, when you teach, when you speak at seminars, when you teach at, uh, when I teach at trialers, college events, I get, I get more out of it than my students do. I mean, yeah. I, that just the, the opportunity to concentrate, on one subject there, uh, prepare to try to uh, communicate that to others. It does so much to uh, educate me. I mean, it, it's like the, my first boss telling me, figure it out on your own. I did figure it out on my own and I learned it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I looked it up once and I used it and, and I didn't have to go back to look again to remember the next time. Now, you, you, know, you talked about how many trials you had the first few years of your career. And, you know, I hear from lawyer after lawyer nowadays, you know, you know it's, it's just impossible for a young lawyer to get trial experience anymore. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I, it's harder. I'd say it's harder than it used to be 40 years ago to get a trial. But if you truly want to try cases, there are plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, I think I've heard you say before uh, that you would go to other lawyers that, that had car wreck cases early in your career and say, hey, let me try your cases. And that, that's kind of a similar thing to what happened to me. When I, when I decided that I wanted to specialize in personal injury cases, uh, there was a, a lawyer that lived in a town about 60 miles from me who was kind of in the, the zenith of his career. Uh, he really uh, cared more about trying criminal cases than he did civil cases, but he was well known and a lot of people came to hire him. And I went to him and said, look, I'll split the fees with you. Let me handle all your civil cases. And uh, oh my gosh, he inundated me with civil cases. And there was a time 
in the county where he lived, where I probably had tried more cases than any other lawyer in the county, uh, just because he was feeding them all to me and I was willing to go try them. And, uh, that really helped, uh, a, give me a boost to my career. Yeah. I think part of it is that you have to ask yourself, do I want to try cases and, and, and do what it takes to learn to try cases, which is getting there and, and trying it with, which are going to be cases where you have a real chance of getting a bloody nose in the second place red ribbon. Uh, or <laughs> is it that I want to try mega cases where I'm going to look good and get a multi-million dollar verdict or on the criminal side, get that not guilty. And, you know, am I not willing to take the risk? Am I not willing to pay the dues and do the hard cases that, that it, frankly, you know, when you're even at my firm, I mean, if we have an awesome, awesome case, I'm going to try it. And, uh, you know, there's trial opportunities at my firm, but they're probably not for the, someone that's only tried one or two cases. You know, I'm not going to send you in there on a multi-million dollar case. I mean, sometimes it's, this sounds awful, but it's like, well, this dog needs to be put to sleep. You, you're going to go take the hit on it, you know? And sometimes they come, you know, I sent Mallory Peacock, my, who's my partner now. I, flat out told her i mean i said look go do your best but you know this is just an old dog that needs to be put to sleep and she came back with a win that i don't think i would have gotten um i was just so pleasantly surprised uh slip and fall slip and fall case against a really really good lawyer and uh you know sometimes you can win cases that a more experienced lawyer can't because you don't yeah. know you can't win it but you know i think it's that are you willing to take the risk and the other thing is i don't know about you but i've lost a few cases I, I have lost probably more than my share. Yeah, I've, I've lost more cases than most people know have tried. Um, yeah, which comes with, you don't, you know, if you want to win more cases than most people have tried, it means you're probably going to go lose some cases too, uh, is, is you have to learn to deal with that. So how do you deal with that? I mean, it's, I mean, it's never fun to lose a case. How do you keep your mojo, so to speak, after a loss? Well, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, it, uh, I, I can rem think back to cases that uh, I, I, I don't remember many that I went into it thinking I'm, I'm fixing to go kick somebody's butt here and end up with a goose egg. But, uh, you know, once you get it, as you know, once you tr pick that jury and once you get in the middle of a trial, I mean, I start thinking that, oh, wow, I, you know, I've got this. You know, I, I start believing my, Absolutely. Believe in my own stuff. And uh, so any case that I try, if I get to the end of it and I lose, it's a heartbreak. And, uh, you know, it's just the kind of thing you got to get up and dust yourself off and get ready for the next one. Um, and I, you know, some people debate whether or not insurance companies look at a particular lawyer and say, Oh, that guy tries cases or that guy does or that lady does not try cases and th that affects their valuation. And I fully believe that it does. I do too. Yeah. I mean, I, I get, uh, you know, some of those get good cases that I would have loved to have tried 20 years ago and had the opportunity to try. I don't get to try now because they offer money that my client just can't turn down. I find even when someone beats you in a trial, if you get, gave them a hard fight uh, and they knew like, hey, I, this, this person didn't just go phone it in, they took it to the mat, I was nervous, I was scared, I don't want to go through that again. They are more like, they respect you more and they're more likely to pay you money. You know, it's always better to win, but if you're just looking at adding value to your cases, you don't even have to win your trials. Just the, the, the willingness to try them and to put the work in in advance so that you try them well. Uh, absolutely you show up and they they know that you put the work in they know that you're ready they know that uh case could have gone either way yeah uh, they're, they're going to think about it the next time before they take you to the mat so some other things i'd like to talk about that uh you and i had a little talk before this about what we're going to talk about and so you've talked a lot about and you put a lot of work into Row reversal and how row reversal techniques um, can be used for a trial. Yeah, well, I you know I think that row reversal, which you and I understand, is just really uh, 
putting yourself in the place of your client, spending the time to uh, really get to know your client. I do this and I know you do this on a serious case that I've, that's going to be tried. I try to spend as much time at my client's home uh, as I can, because I think there's, you, you really get to know them uh, a whole lot better than you can in the, the sterile environs of your office. But even from the initial interview, you know, before I went to the trial lawyers college, it was like I would interview a client and I'm really looking at them as a cause of action yeah. as opposed to a, a, a living, breathing person. I'm asking them uh, questions only designed to elicit the facts of their case and not really talking to them about what their hopes and dreams and uh, family and uh, background and all those things that really mean something to that person. Um, and, it, you know, one of the remarkable things that I found in my practice after I was a student at the trial lawyers college is that my, my relationship with my clients is so much deeper, uh, so much more enjoyable. Uh, you know, we all run across people in our daily lives or in our practice that, you know, maybe I know early on I'd say, well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm just not really fond of this person. Right. But when you get to know that person and you get to understand uh, who they really are and the, the, the facts, the experiences of that person below just the surface uh, of uh, what causes of action they represent, you can find something that you like or love about just about anyone. Um, and the way that you do that is we call it a, a, a listening exercise at the trial lawyers college. Uh, and it is, uh, kind of listening for this, the, uh, the story underneath the words that are being spoken, trying to recognize the emotions that go into what the person is saying. And it's amazing how that person feels valued. Uh, it may be the first time in their life that anyone ever really heard them or they felt like someone really cared about what they had to say. And that's, that solidifies that bond between the client and the, the lawyer and really helps you be their advocate and present their story. Yeah, I really had that come home to me my last trial. I, I mean, I've said that before and I thought it was some people, but you know, whether we ever collect a dime of my last verdict, uh, just the transformation I saw in her over the, the week of trial and the, in the weeks leading up to trial of, I think for the first time in her life being valued as a human being and being listened to and not being interrupted and not being dismissed, I think is going to have, I hope, a transformational change in her life, regardless of the financial outcome of the case. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, to me, uh, looking back over uh, my career, that's what, I mean, that's really what this is about. I mean, that, you know, I became a lawyer as cliche as it sounds to help people. And uh, I think most of us that, uh, that love what we do, say the same thing and uh you know regardless of the financial success those relationships are are hugely important i mean i get people send me cases uh even today that i represented 30 some years ago or or now i uh, like a couple of weeks ago i had a lady come see me who's now a nurse when I met her, she was a four-year-old who had lost her daddy in an oil field oh, wow. accident. And, uh, you know, just the fact that she would uh, love me, uh, and I haven't seen her since she was 
24 and now she's 25. Um, just you talk about uh, fulfilling. Yeah. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to Delisi at CowanLaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at CowanLaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. Let me ask you this. I mean, I know psychodrama is a way to incorporate role reversal and put it into action, but do you need to do a full-on psychodrama to reverse roles with somebody? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I it's it's a skill that has to be learned, obviously. But I, I mean, you can do it in just in conversations, uh, you know, with a with someone or with your wife or with your your friends or with your partners in your law firm. And I, it's just trying really hard to see things from the point of view of the other person. Um, and uh, no, you don't have to do uh, a psychodrama in order to do it. Uh, I, I think you can do it in everyday conversations. Yeah, I think it's also in you know in dealing with our when we're talking to our staff people, dealing with our clients. You know the because the fact is we 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 used to travel a lot before we got stuck at home, and we you know we're doing all kinds of things, and often it's a paralegal or someone else that's taken the the daily calls, and you know we have you know like you've represented brain injured individuals before they can be very yeah. difficult to deal with on a daily basis because they're brain injured. I mean, you know, they don't exactly. remember things. They don't, they get irrationally angry. They don't process things well. Uh, but any, any client that's facing the, some severe loss is going to have, you know, a long-term change in their life, you know, whether it's because they're not going to be able to work again, or they're going to need, you know, medical care for the rest of their lives. They don't know how to pay for it. You know, just reversing roles and realizing the stress and fear uh, and anxiety that, that they're going through and then going through a system that is absolutely foreign. It's almost a, a foreign language, a foreign way of thinking that makes no sense. Uh, when you go into your interactions with that frame of mind, it's a lot easier to approach them with love and comfort instead of being reactive and, and pushing back and being offended when they get worked up or upset or use an ugly tone. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and that, um, it's really something that I, I have to confess. I don't do enough training on in my firm. Uh, I need to concentrate on doing that more. Uh, but I, not too long ago, I spoke to a group of, uh, legal assistants and, uh, that's what we did as a part of my talk is we did the listening exercise. And I can't tell you, I mean, you know what it was like doing it the very first time and how, uh, how really valued you feel when someone's really listening to you and they can uh, talk about not only what you said, but also uh, some of the emotions that you, you felt in, in experiences that you've had in your life. That group talked about how transformational it was have sent me emails since then talking about how it's helped them in dealings with their clients. And I think that's something that we don't use enough yeah. uh, in our offices. You've also talked about before when we were talking, you know, before this listening with a third ear, when you're doing this kind of listening, what do you mean by listening with a third ear? Um, Listening with your heart, uh, listen, I mean, listening, not just with the two ears that you have, but listening for that story that is beneath the words that are being spoken. And that third ear is the emotional content of what you're hearing from the client. 
and it, it when you when you concentrate hard and when you really focus on what that person's saying and empathize with what they're saying and what they're going through that's when you activate that third ear and I, you know, maybe to some of the listeners, it sounds hokey, but I promise you, if you'll just take the time in a quiet place and listen closely and listen for the words, maybe the words that are not being spoken, uh, but the, those words that if they um, had the ability and some of our clients don't have the ability, but if they had the, the ability to say those words, those are the emotions that would be coming out from what they said. Yeah. And I think it's a, and that's one thing that, that listening exercise and I, I don't know, some of our listeners have gone through it. Some haven't, but one thing to me that's so important when we're talking about reversing roles is that in the listening exercise, you know, one person sits behind the other, the person in front says something and then the person behind tries to say it back so that the person behind, all you're doing is you're listening. You're trying to put back what they're saying, not a commentary, not, but a really important part of it is you check in. Is that right? Does that fit? And I think, yeah. you know, at least with our own clients, you know, the, I do a lot of role reversal in my head, but yeah. then I also make sure that it's not just my fantasy. I need to go check in and make sure that that's really what the other person's going through. And, you know, just think like in a marriage, you know, I, I may, my, my wife might think because of my behavior one day or my mood that I'm mad at her or that maybe there's something she did or that I'm feeling guilty about something that I may have done that I don't want her to know about. You know, I may be, you know, upset or preoccupied over a case over someone that cut me off in traffic over my parents. I mean, over a million things that have nothing to do with her, but if we don't, check not just reverse roles but then check in to see are we accurate i think that uh, there's a danger and i think that's one great thing that exercise teaches is is tuning in to see are you getting it right or not when you're trying to reverse roles or trying to listen with that third ear that's a really good point and i and i'd also point out that i mean you can be sitting uh across the table from the person uh and uh Sometimes if you will sit the same way, the client yeah. sitting, uh, with the things that they say, perhaps repeat back to them the last two or three words of what they said, like you're talking about, say to that person. So what I'm hearing you say is, you know, this, this has happened or you've had, you've experienced this emotion or, you know, your family's been affected in these various ways just to, to, uh, and that validates what you're saying and it also, or what they are saying. And it also, uh, makes them, uh, feel free to share with you those things. Absolutely. You know, we talk about doing this with our clients. How about reversing roles and using the listening and the, with defendants of people that are on the other side of the case? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that it's effective and I try to do this before I go into deposition, uh, to think about and ponder on and reverse roles with the defendant, uh, to try and think about those things that if they felt free to tell you that, uh, they would, you know, think about the things that in a private meeting with their lawyer, Maybe they've shared with the lawyer, but they would never say to you. Right. And so a lot of depositions, I'll start with, not with what's your name or where do you live? Or, uh, I'll start with something like, uh, Mr. Jones, have you accepted, uh, your fault for causing this wreck or Mr. Jones, <clears throat> you acknowledge, don't you, that you were at fault and you caused this wreck or Mr. Jones, have you accepted your responsibility for what's happened to my client as, as a result of this wreck? And it's amazing how that question or questions like that. And there's a a thousand different variations of it catches that person off guard. You know, they're not, 
they're not 30 minutes into the deposition after you've asked all the, the facts right. and figures about their life. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I, for one, don't take four hour depositions. Uh, and sometimes I take really, really short depositions when I get answers to questions like that, that, um, uh, kind of go to the heart of what we're talking about. Yep. Absolutely. I think the other thing that is really good is that it helps us approach in, in our words, in our body language, in our tone, approach the defendant without anger, without, you know, let their words, let their conduct get the jury upset. Because, you know, if we come in upset or angry or mean, the jury's not with us. They have to get there on their own. And we can really and I learned this early in my career the hard way, we can really turn off a jury. Uh, and, yeah. you know, a lot of times we are really mad at the defendants because of what they did and especially all the crap their lawyers are doing. But if we go back and, and just try to reverse roles and see it from that defendant's point of view, which isn't excusing what they did at all, uh, you know, because, right. you know, I've got a 15 year old son who I love more than life itself. Uh, but I have to have, father son conversations, which is not always, you're doing great son. Sometimes it's like, Hey, you <clears throat> off your butt and you, this isn't right. You need to do this differently. Uh, or, or there's going to be a consequence. And I think sometimes we have to look at ourselves as, you know, society's loving parents, fathers and mothers with these companies and these defendants. It's not that we hate them or want them to unduly suffer, but when they do wrong, if they don't have to make up for it and, and, you know, compensate the people they hurt, then they're not going to, you know, it's actually a moral failing on them. Uh, it's going to hurt them because they're not going to improve. Uh, they're not going to get better. So I think that, but, but then that lets the jury get mad at them when they don't react appropriately. When you're coming at them from the right place and then they react costly to you because you hit a nerve. Well, then who's the jury? Who, who's the jury going to think the bad guy then? Yeah. I, and I, Another thing, Michael, that I think is really important is like in these commercial trucking cases to push the responsibility for what happened as high up the totem pole as you possibly can. Yeah. I mean, that, that in, in some of my cases, it seems like that the, the uh, operator of the commercial motor vehicle is almost as much a victim as my client is. And they got, thrust unwittingly into a situation where uh, this was just a, an accident waiting to happen and they weren't properly trained and they weren't tr properly vetted and they weren't properly warned and they didn't have the proper safety training and they weren't reminded of, of the things, the dangers that they face. They weren't reminded of all the things that are in the commercial motor vehicle um, rule book. And, um, that's when a jury really gets torqued up is when, when you've got a situation like that, they've got a, a driver who they can probably identify with, but you got yeah. somebody up the totem pole. That's a safety manager, uh, that is not doing their job, or you got a company that is so anxious to get their trucks out on the road and carry their goods from point A to point B that they forget all about the safety of the other people on the highway. Yeah. Or they put out a manual that says, these are all the things you need to do to be safe. But then they, in the way they pay their drivers by the mile and the way they dispatch them and push them. If you don't break all those rules, you can't make a living. Uh, exactly. And I think yep. that, that that's to me the best case of hypocrisy is they know the right way to do it. But then for, for money are just not, a lot of it's just not caring enough about the value of other human beings, both the, the other people on the roadway and your own drivers. I mean, to have someone, you know, tonight you're going to sleep from midnight to 8 a.m. Tomorrow you're going to sleep from, you know, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You know, we're just to, to put people through that uh, and then put people in, in in situations where they have to cheat and lie to make money because the company's, you know, looking the other way and putting them in situations where, you know, you're getting paid by the mile and if you follow the rules and all the time you got stuck in traffic and all the time you wait around or being counted against your hours, whether we're not going to, even though you're there working for us, we're not going to pay you for all that time. Uh, yeah. You know, that's so unfair to these drivers. But, you know, if, if we go just try to beat up on the truck drivers, I mean, 
I'm, we're big, powerful lawyers beating up on work, working people trying to make a living. It's not, not very motivating. No. And that's where, like you say, uh, you can raise the ire of the jury towards you as opposed to where it ought to be focused on these people that are up above calling the shots and, and putting these uh, poor uh, truck drivers in the situation where they, if they want to make a living and feed their family, they're going to have to violate the rules. Yeah. Just switching truckers to hourly pay would, would save so many lives every year, I think. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Something else that we've talked about, and, and it's actually, a, I heard this very early in my career from a magistrate judge named John Black, and then it, it just kind of warned, he was one of my mentors, he's since passed, but it's, uh, it just brought a warmth to my heart because you said the same thing today when we were talking before the, the interview about, there's a difference between trying 50 cases and trying the same case 50 times. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? Well, I, and I have to make a personal confession to, to make the point, but uh, you know, I, I went to the trial lawyers college after I had practiced law 18 years uh, and I tried a lot of cases uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't know, I probably was pushing a hundred cases or more by that time. And, but I worked hard. I worked hard on my cases, but I didn't give the cases the individual attention that they deserved. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, we we used whiteout still in those days. I'd take a board ire from a case that I'd done before and white out the names and write in the new name and take that over. And that would be my outline for my board ire rather than uh, really pondering on that particular case uh, and just, you know, think I could cookie cutter my cases and go do well. And I, I you know, I, I was reasonably successful, uh, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I do now. Uh, you know, obviously the size of the cases that I try now are, are different than they were uh, 22 years ago, but um, I just find that my practice is so much more satisfying because I uh, spend the time, take the time to know the clients, to know the, the cases inside and out, to uh, know the science, if it's a case that involves science. And, um, you know, you just, I, I don't think that I could still be doing this at at age 65, uh, if all I was doing is going over and saying the same words over and over and trying to make yeah. those apply to their, to different cases. And I think it's one of the big advantages we have over, you know, a lot of defense lawyers, I see you can get their prior transcripts and they'll use the same analogies, the same stories and everything else over and over. And, uh, and I was somewhat guilty of this. I mean, I would, I would still say things like go to the client's house, make sure we had friends and family, but I started off trying a lot of car wreck cases and, you know, was doing well. Not every case, but, you know, every third, second or third trial, I'd get a verdict no one else could get in the county on a chiropractor only case and kind of got a system. But about eight, 10 years into it, my verdict started going down. And hmm. what I realized is a couple of things. One, I was getting in a rut and just kind of <laughs> checking the boxes and going through and trying the same case over and over. Uh, but the other thing is just the, in 10 years, the societal attitudes, jury pool had changed and the, the arguments, themes that worked 10 years before didn't work as well. And, and it, you know, I feel bad for the clients that got the mediocre results kind of in that halfway part of my career. But for me personally, it's kind of gave me the kick in the butt I needed to start diving in deep again and, and really, uh, trying to improve and get better and, find ways and then you know eventually got the guts to start saying no to cases and that which gave me the time to really work up the ones I had you ever have any problem problem saying no to a good case just because oh gosh <laughs> yeah I, you know I, I can still remember back to where I was uh, scrambling for cases when I when I decided I would go out on my own I went from 
my hometown of Henderson to where I live now in Longview, which to me was the big city at the time. It was probably 70,000 people. Um, and, I, you know, I was just looking for any kind of case. I mean, I even did a title opinion for a, a, an oil and gas company during that time because I just, I, I, I had to figure out some way to, to bring in some money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still hard for me to say no. I mean, because I still look at it and say, well, you know, there's somebody in the firm that could handle this and, and uh, do a good job for the client. And part, that's part of the reason why it's hard for me to say, no, I see these folks and I see the need. And I, I think about what might happen if they go to the wrong lawyer. Uh, and I, you know, I, I worry about, whether or not they're going to get the justice that they deserve. I used to pride myself in taking hard cases. I used to feel like that I could, I could handle a case that maybe some other lawyer could not successfully do. And, um, but like you have discovered, there comes a point where there's only so much of you to go around and there's only so much longer that you're going to be around. And, uh, I, I'm not interested in doing things that I'm not interested in doing. Yeah. Uh, At this point in my career, there's three things on the, on the real tough cases that, you know, one is learning. There's only so much of me to go around and, and of that is only so much of it. At this point, I work a lot, but there's only, I don't want to work every weekend anymore. Uh, I, I want to be a dad. I want to be a husband. I want to do some things for myself. So you know, every hour I spend on that marginal case is an hour I'm not spending on one of my really good cases with someone that is really deserving and really needs me. Uh, the other thing I found both from the clients and from referring lawyers, the expectations in their heart of hearts are not tempered by the difficulty of their case. Uh, and the clients don't have a way of measuring what is a good value for this case with these tough liability facts. And so often you, you put in all that hard work you turn, you know, you pulled a rabbit out of a hat and you don't have a status, you don't have satisfied people because you're being judged against the results that you got or someone else got on a case that was a great case. And then the third thing is just having the humility to know that there are other good lawyers out there that are at a point in their career where they would do a better job than I would on this case because it would be their bigger case and it would be the one they would be uh, putting their effort in and, and learning that I'm not going to never get a client again, or I'm not going to lose my referring lawyer. If I don't say, you know, this would have been the right case for me five years ago, but it's not the right case for me today. Here's a couple of people that I think would do a great job. And that's been so hard for me. Uh, but you know, now that I'm doing it, I've not lost any of my referring lawyers. They seem quite happy that, uh, and if anything, they're more likely for me to be, bring me the big case because they see me more as a big case lawyer than as someone that will take anything. And then maybe they got to save their big cases for a big case lawyer. Uh, but it but it has been the hardest thing in the world for me, uh, both in overcoming the fear and then overcoming the guilt of I'm not helping this person that asked me for help. Uh, it's just been a, a lot, a lot of uh, discipline and a lot of working on myself to be able to say no. Well, that, that's great insight, Michael. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, so I screw know, up a lot, John, and so <laughs> I try to learn from it. <laughs> well, you know, and the other thing is that with referring lawyers, uh, the, the tendency that, that I have, and I'm sure many, many people listening have is to say yes to every case that a refer, a good referring lawyer sends. Uh, and, but that's just, that's just wrongheaded. I, I, I just don't think, I don't think you do the referring lawyer any favors. I don't think you improve your relationship with that lawyer by doing that. And, um, so that's another area that I've had to work on my ability to say, gosh, I'm going to have to pass on this one. Thank you so much for thinking of me, but just can't do it. Yep. Enjoying the episode. Do you wish you had trial lawyer nation on the go? Well, wish no more. The trial lawyer nation app is available now exclusively on iOS devices. Access our entire podcast library, create a favorites list, search for old and new episodes, and much more. 
It truly is Trial Lawyer Nation at your fingertips. Download this free app now and enjoy the top legal podcast for plaintiff attorneys wherever you go. Well, I want to kind of see, I love telling trial, I love hearing trial stories, and I want to hear an example. Uh, you had a recent uh, nice verdict in Tampa, Florida on a case you got to try with your nephew uh, where you got to put some of the stuff in action. Can you tell me a little bit about that case? Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So I, I have a, a nephew uh, who is my sister's oldest son, and he grew up uh, in Longview, actually, and uh, went to law school after he'd been out working a while at South Texas and married a Florida girl and moved over there uh, to live. And so he and I have gotten to work together some. And, uh, you know, that desire to, to show your, uh, Ken folks kind of the ropes. Um, but he had a, a case where he represented a gentleman who was an, uh, Indian, uh, from India. Um, and he had gotten, he's driving down an interstate highway in Florida and he sees up ahead of him a tire, what looks like a tire in the road. And, uh, he slams on his brakes, maybe hit his brakes a little too hard. It certainly, that was the defendant's uh, version of the story, but he, he had cars on either side of him, so he couldn't go that way. And he gets slammed into from behind by, uh, an 18 wheeler. This gentleman, his, his name's Prim. Gurbani. Uh, Mr. Gurbani is as hard a worker as anyone I've ever known. Um, he grew up in India, poor as, as uh, dirt, and uh, ended up moving to Hong Kong when he was in his early 20s, and then from Hong Kong to New York, and then finally to Tampa. And in Tampa, he found his dream job. Well, he actually moved to Orlando. In Orlando, he found his dream job, and that was he was worked in the shop just inside the gate at Universal Studio. Oh, wow. And his, yeah, and his job was selling fast passes to people coming to the park with their families. And he just absolutely adored that interaction with people and that job. Uh, called it the best job he'd ever had in his life, his dream job. And so he has the wreck. He's taken to the emergency room because he's got a kind of a nasty cut on his head where he went back and hit the back of the sunroof. And uh, in the medical records at the hospital, he's already talking about, when can I go back to work? I want to go back to work. and Sure enough, he gets out of the hospital, convalesces for a couple of weeks, and is back at work at Universal Studios selling fast passes. And worked up until the time of trial. He had some pretty minor orthopedic injuries, nothing really major. But he had a traumatic brain injury, a mild traumatic brain injury, as a result of the wreck had about $19,000 in past medical bills. Uh, so we, of course, left those out of what, what our proof was at trial um, and just talked about uh, the brain injury that he had, the uh, changes in his personality that had occurred, uh, the changes in uh, what his future was going to be. And I think that was really a big component of our damages in the case uh, because we had some expert testimony that it would probably lead to uh, early onset of dementia. Uh, he was, he was 62 at the time of our trial. So, you know, probably um, those things were going to happen to him in the next decade or so. And, but what helped the case and what drives damages in a lot of these cases, as you know, is just 
uh, insensitivity on the other side. Uh, Mr. Gurbani, as in many of the cases that I try that involve brain injured individuals, was not at trial. Uh, but I wanted him there for Vordar, and uh, I got permission from the jury uh, in Vordar uh, for him to not attend the trial because, as you know, uh, one of the main things that brain injured clients have to hold on to is hope. Yeah, hope, hope that they're they're going to get better. Hope that their future is not going to involve the need for either people coming into the home or even having to go to a, a, a facility to spend their golden years. And uh, the defense lawyer was such a jerk that while Mr. Gurbani is sitting there in the courtroom in front of the jury, uh, he made him cry. Hmm. Yeah. And he, and, and and, um, you know, it was obvious looking at him that he was genuine in his tears. And, of course, the defense lawyer then uh, raised hell about it, moved from mistrial, uh, you know, just crazy acting. And um, a real difficulty was that he and his wife pretty much stayed to themselves. They didn't have a lot of friends. You know, he, he had people at work. He had a guy who was a, a, a security officer at the park that he had really befriended. And he ended up being our only uh, before and after witness, but he was wow. a great one. So what kind and, of changes uh, did you have? I mean, just, uh, you know, short-term memory loss, uh, some uh, easily frustrated he noticed that he would uh, kind of have sensitivity to light, but he still, I mean, he had the ability to continue to do his job and uh, no criticisms, no negative reviews, nothing yeah. like that. Um, we had, uh, we had a neuro neuropsychologist that testified that did a really good job for us. And we had a neurologist that testified that did a really good job for us. Uh, we had some, uh, uh, three Tesla MRIs that that uh, had some findings that were consistent with brain injury. So we were able to make it real for the jury. And uh, the security officer just did a fabulous job. Great. Um, yeah. And so we got it. We got a verdict for a little over three million dollars. Wow. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I like Tampa, Florida. I think we actually our judge was uh, educated at South Texas School of Law. Oh wow! Just like my yeah, just like my nephew. <laughs> apparently, and I don't know why this is, but apparently there's quite a few lawyers in Tampa that went to uh, South Texas. So, so yeah, that was a great verdict. What kind of offers did y'all have before trial? Uh, he they offered ninety thousand. The uh, the week before trial, and then they on the Monday that we started, they offered two fifty, and um, you know by that time it was just uh, that that wasn't going to make any material change in the client's life. And um, I'll tell you another idiotic thing that they did is they they hired uh, some people to do some surveillance video, yeah, and, and <laughs> just to show. Uh, and, and, you know, isn't it a beautiful thing that, that a lot of times in the cases where we get good verdicts, the reason for that, and I, you know, I have to say this in all modesty, I don't think it was that I did such a fabulous job. I think the defense lawyer did such a terrible job that it really hurt them. But they, so they bring these people that have done surveillance on Mr. Gurbani. And one of the things that they've done is they've, they've been in the shop where he works and they, you know, they've got their little uh, iPhone on their belt and they're using that to film him so they can remain anonymous. And I cross examined them like it was spy versus spy. Uh, but the dumbest thing that they did was they, they 
videoed Mr. Gurbani bringing his wife, who unfortunately was not able to come to trial because her health was so bad, walking his wife from their car back to their modest little apartment. And it just was so obvious looking at the film what a caring, loving relationship they had. You know, he's supporting her, holding her by her elbow and walking her back to the apartment. And they played that. I mean, it, it wasn't something that I discovered and played for the jury to show how ridiculous they were. They played that thinking that would somehow help them in defeating his, uh, his claim. So I, I have to admit a, a little bit surprised. I was a little surprised at the verdict, but, uh, you know, it's one of those cases that you look back on and you think, I got to try this with my nephew uh, and everything just went right. Um, those are the sweetest trials, aren't they? When you don't expect it and then boom. Right. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, 250 was way too low, but, you know, let's say if they offered $500,000, how could I say to Mr. Gurbani? You know, you need to turn that down. We'll do better. Uh, and then the greatest thing about it was we, in Florida, they have what's called a proposal for settlement. And if you, uh, if, if you give that to the defendant and you exceed it by more than 10%, which we did, um, they have to pay all the costs and attorney's fees from that oh, wow. point on. Yeah. So it was, it was the really nice verdict and really one of the highlights, you know, not the biggest verdict ever, but certainly one of the highlights of my career. It is amazing how many times you talk to experienced trial lawyers and their favorite verdict isn't necessarily the biggest one. That's it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's <laughs> a trial is uh, a combination of so many things. And there's so many things that can go right. Uh, then there's the, those things that keep you up at night that there's so many things that can go wrong. Uh, that when it all goes right, it just, uh, you know, I can't look back. I don't look, I look back on that trial and I can't think of anything that I wish that I had done differently. Well, maybe one thing, one, one thing was we didn't get this guy's cell phone records until right at trial. And since we hadn't shared those with the other side, we couldn't talk about how he was on his cell phone at the time of wow. the collision. But like what I was talking about earlier, I mean, what, one of the things that drove damages in this case was that this truck driver's employer didn't care about safety. You know, they had a safety procedure that they were supposed to follow. Uh, and it was a part of their policies and procedures manual. And they didn't follow any of it. Uh, they didn't, you know, they were supposed to take pictures at the scene and the driver didn't do that. And he wasn't criticized for doing that. They were supposed to have a debriefing with the driver about what happened and why it happened. They didn't do any of those things. Uh, you know, they were supposed to, uh, after a, an incident like this, determine fault. And they didn't do that. Um, and so the jury looked at that and just said, you know, we got to do something here. We've got to speak or this could happen to someone else. And, uh, they spoke. It's funny. I'm doing a case right now and the uh, safety guy at the company. So like someone at, at work smashed his finger and, you know, didn't break it, but smashed his finger, cut it up in a machine. And they had a big safety reason briefing. They did a root cause analysis. They gave a lessons to be learned how to avoid this. In our case, the uh, defendant, the company driver, blew a stop sign going over 50 miles an hour, um, and caused a horrific, horrific crash. Our client was in the hospital for 43 days. And in the presentation they sent to the company, they just said one of our drivers was involved in a crash in an intersection. They didn't mention the the stop sign. They didn't mention anyone getting hurt. They didn't mention, you know, they just uh, said, be, be careful while you're driving. One of our drivers was in a crash. Here's a couple of pictures and nothing to do to try to prevent the next one. Uh, although six months later, they did write them up. Didn't give them any consequence, but it's just insane. Uh, but it just shows how much they really care about safety. Right. 
Yeah. And did they write him up because they really felt like they should do that so that the other drivers learn a valuable lesson or did they write him up because they had pressure from somewhere else, like their insurance carrier or a lawyer like you, or, I mean, it, it was after we filed the lawsuit and noticed that was what they wrote them up. <laughs> there, there, there you go. And so the jury looks at that and they say, what, what do we have to do for this company to understand this is not the kind of behavior that, that we um, will tolerate? I mean, in our case in Florida, we didn't have a punitive damage claim. That was all actual damages. Uh, but... As you know, when you have facts like that, that that show a careless attitude, even at the top, um, it tends to drive damages. Yeah. And what I think is, is it's not that it motivates a jury to punish. It's just it's what a jury needs to fully compensate. A, a, a lot of jurors will not follow the law and give full damages unless they believe the defendant deserves to pay it. Uh, I think that's. Yeah. That's one of the big problems with the admitted liability cases. You need psychologically for the jury both elements. The the plaintiff deserves to get paid, and but the, also the defendant deserves to pay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, John, thank you so much for for joining us. If somebody wants to go out there and you know talk to you about a case or uh, you know reach out to you, how what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, just call my office in Longview, Texas. That's where I usually am. We we have offices in Longview and Houston and Santa Fe, New Mexico, but I, uh, I like to hang around Longview as much as I can. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and all John's contact info are going to be in the show notes. So check it out if you need to get a hold of them. And thank you so much for joining us today, John. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for the service that you provide to plaintiff's lawyers everywhere. Thank you for joining us on trial lawyer nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content, in live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan. It is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.